1988, they went on to release Oliver and Company, based on the Charles Dickens novel Oliver Twist. However, this is more different than the novel. It was set in modern times in New York City, Oliver was a cat, and Fagin's gang were dogs. It's about a rich girl who finds Oliver and brings him to her mansion, but then they both got kidnapped by Fagin's boss, Skies, so it's up to Fagin's dogs to save the pair. Is it just me, or is there a lot of kidnapping in Disney films during those days? Anyways, they had six supervising animators, a team of over 300 artists, and technical workers were able to spend more than two and a half years to make this film. Designers had to go to New York City to make some pictures in a dog's eye view, which is like 18 inches off the ground. Yeah, they get weird stares from people who saw them, but that just makes the references even better for the artists. Originally, it was supposed to be set after The Rescuers, showing Penny and Rufus the Cat's new life in New York City, but then that idea got quickly scrapped. For this film, they used a lot of computer animation. The buildings, the structures, the transportations, even the objects were all computer animated, making this the first film to have its own department set up expressively for the purpose of generating computer animation. But not everything was computer animated. For the background, they had to use zero graphic overlays. To bring in more realism, they put in a lot of ads like Coca-Cola, USA Today, and Sony to really feel like you're in New York City. In the beginning of the song, Why Should I Worry, we can see Peg, Jock, and Trusty from Lady and a Tramp, and even Pongo from 101 Dalmatians. When it was released, it wasn't alone. It was released the same day of Don Bluth's The Land Before Time. Both films got good reviews from critics for the same reasons, but financially, it was The Land Before Time that earned more. That's the time when Disney realized that Bluth means business. During that same year, they released Who Framed Roger Rabbit? I'm not going to go into details about this film, I'm just going to save it for later. Anyways, this Spielberg and Disney film grabbed the world's attention for Disney's animation. Also, they released VHS's of their classic films for the kids and younger viewers and for the fans of the Disney classics. In those VHS's, before the film would begin, they put in a certain trailer of their next project. Why am I talking about this? Well, the Roger Rabbit film and the VHS's would help make this film become one of Disney's biggest successes. That film was The Little Mermaid. It's the tale of a mermaid called Ariel who falls in love with a human on a ship. Only one problem. She's a mermaid, not a human. So, she sees Ursula, and Ariel gives her voice to her so she can have legs instead of fins. In 1985, Ron Clemens found a collection of Hans Christian Andersen books and then showed a draft of a movie based on one of his books, The Little Mermaid, to then-CEO Michael Eisner. During that time, the company wanted to make a sequel to the film Splash. One day, the staff found some art development by Kay Nielsen and a story of the Little Mermaid that was made in the 30s. You see, Walt Disney always wanted to do a short based on the Anderson tale, but couldn't because of the war. So the artists used those artworks as references. It was their return to fairy tales since Sleeping Beauty. That same year, John Musker came in to help Ron write and fix the script. In 1987, songwriter Howard Ashman, who did The Little Shop of Horrors, decided to work on the film as well, since he was also working on Oliver and Company at the time. He suggested changing a character named Clarence, who was an English butler crab, into a Jamaican Rastafarian crab and making the music style reflect that, and thus, making Sebastian who he is now. Also, Ron, Howard, John, and Walt Disney Pictures boss Jeffrey Katzenberg changed the story format into an animated Broadway musical. 
this film had probably more sound effects than any other animated film they did, since almost 80% of the film needed a sound effect. It was noted to be the last film to use the serography process, since the next film would use caps. I'll tell you about it later. On its world premiere on November 17, 1989, it screened on all 10 AMC Pleasure Island theater screens at Downtown Disney in Walt Disney World. When it was released everywhere else, it was legendary. They grossed more than $200 million worldwide, so you can guarantee that they finally beat Don Bluth at the box office when he released All Dogs Go to Heaven without Steven Spielberg. Critics praised the film like a god, and it won two Oscars for Best Original Score and for Best Song, Under the Sea. On January 2008, they released a Broadway stage version that became successful, but then they had to close it down on August 30th, 2009. The film began an age called the Disney Renaissance, a time when every Disney film released became legendary animated films, just like if Walt himself would make them. In 1990, they released the company's first ever sequel, The Rescuers Down Under. The story is about a kid in Australia named Cody who rescued a giant golden eagle named Marahute from the poacher Percival C. McLeach, but then the kid gets kidnapped himself. So it's up to Miss Bianca and Bernard, along with Wilbur and the Rescue Aid Society Australian representative, Jake, to go and save Cody. Five key members of the creative team had to go to the Australian outlet to check the true beauty of Australia that they wanted in the film. They came back with a lot of pictures of historical landmarks, like Ayers Rock, Catherine Gorge, and the Kakadu National Park, and a buttload of filled sketchbooks. It was the first Disney film to fully use the cap process, but not the first to ever use it. That title goes to The Little Mermaid. The cap's process is to have computer effects in a hand-drawn animated film. It was created by a company that Disney had made partners for this that you may have heard of called Pixar. This is the second Disney film to not have any musical numbers. The first one was, once again, The Black Cauldron. One of the characters from the first Rescuers who didn't appear in this film was Orville, the Albatross. It was all because of Jim Jordan. Why? Well, mainly because he was dead at the time. So Roy E. Disney, the nephew of Walt Disney, suggested a character named Wilbur, who would be Orval's brother, to replace him. By the way, Roy got the name from one of the Wright brothers, Wilbur Wright since the other one was Orval Wright. Pretty clever of you, Roy. When it was released, the critics gave it a lot of positive reviews, but sadly, it didn't do good at the box office with around $27 million. Originally, they planned to do a third film of The Rescuers, but the idea got ditched after Eva Gabor, the voice of Miss Bianca, passed away. The financial failure of The Rescuers Down Under is now probably the key reason why Disney wouldn't ever do a sequel again. There had to be another studio that had to do it for them, 